Is that okay? Um, okay, so this is the um, same project from the same people at the same place. Um, and you know the deal with papers with the word towards in the title. Um, this is obviously not very mature work. The software we're showing off is obviously mature, but um, using it to study emergence that Ed alluded to earlier um, is quite new. Um, and then putting a computational reading on that is very new. Uh, and I'll be doing a lot of this later on, so I might as well get used to it right now. Um, it's very hand wavy towards the end. Um, and hopefully I'll have time to show you the latest version of the app um, with lots of the things fixed that um, Ed mentioned in the previous talk. Um, so very briefly, we want to democratize game design, um, study games as the most important artwork forms of the 21st century, um, and then try and make some money so we don't have to um, keep renewing our research contracts um, every three or four years. Um, and the Gamica Technology Project um, addresses all of those, really, because um, democratizing, as Ed pointed out, you can now make games, um, casual games, right there on your phone. Um, that includes people who ordinarily uh, wouldn't um, do so, including artists. Um, and so we're hoping that um, visual artists will begin to think of rules and interaction in the same way they think of line and form. Um, and uh, so everyone should be able to express themselves through games. And obviously, if we have it on an app, um, there is commercial potential there. Um, there are four main aspects to it, um, but Ed's really gone through these very quickly, so I won't um, labor the point. There's a decomposition of the games into a search space. Um, there's a GUI that you've just been shown. Um, we have game gen abilities, which I'll come back to later, and playtesting abilities. Um, and yeah, we can generate things with emergent properties. Coming back to the final question of, of Ed's talk, um, I'll be showing you know, how emergent things come about. A, a few more game mechanics with the demo that I'll give. Um, in the previous game, it was all, in the previous talk, it was all about this one game, let it snow, um, or towards the end, and there, there weren't many game mechanics in there. Um, so we have an app with which people can make a whole game, uh, a whole casual game, with their thumb in minutes and hours, rather than days and weeks, or in some cases of indie game development, years and decades. Um, so recently, I, I wanted to get 10 games out so that we could play them in a little competition in the lab. Um, and it took 90 minutes to make 10 games, uh, of, uh, 10 levels of the same type of game. And each of the 10 levels had a slightly different game mechanic in it. So if, if you know what you're doing, it can be very quick. Um, and that's obviously what we're hoping for. Um, so it's been made it possible to record entire game design sessions with um, designers uh, in, in you know, a feasible amount of time and to analyze them um, with talk aloud, um, with, you know, with voice aloud um, technology. Uh, methodologies from psychology. Um, so yeah, we've, uh, it's enabled us to study how ideas for games emerge from the design process rather than being prescribed in advance. Um, so the, really looking at um, what the software gives you back rather than how you get the software to give you something. Um, so, and we're beginning to think about a computational reading of that. So essentially we want to work out how software could take advantage of emergent properties as it's making games um, rather than particularly understanding how we do it. Um, so the user interface, um, as Ed's already demoed, um, the modus operandi is to start with the base camp entry, keep playing around with it until you're satisfied with the game. And we, we have in mind a, a video of less than a minute where we start with Frogger and we end with Asteroids um, to show how flexible the search space is. Um, the players tend to move a controller or tap things. Um, friends and foes, two types of balls bounce around, um, and certain events score, uh, trigger scoring, and then the scoring eventually leads to a, a game end. Um, or a timer runs out. Um, there's six different types of screens, but I'm going to concentrate um, really on the mutation, uh, drawing, and slider. Um, but as Ed's already done that, I'm going to very quickly skip, uh, skip over these slides. Um, mutations, essentially, uh, if you want to change the lighting of your game, you dial around like that, and the more you dial around, the more it goes uh, up here, and the more uh, uh, advanced the mutation is or um, pronounced. Um, similarly, you've got interaction, audio, scoring, backing, uh, that's the kind of background. Um, so there's a nice one-stop mutation screen, um, and there used to be a button in the middle which you just mutate everything, um, and we have that now in the most recent. Um, as a nice example of this, um, Ed implemented a, a new mechanic when I was playing around with it, or a new aspect where um, balls didn't have to stick directly to the thing in the middle that you're controlling, and they were passing over it, and I was playing around with that. I clicked, I, I mutated um, backing, and I mutated control, interaction, sorry, um, and uh, not backing, lighting. 
and it gave me a very dark aesthetic and it made that I had to hang on to the, uh, to the controller the whole time. And that was really the basic um, and most interesting game mechanic of this game called Pendulands, which has gone on to become um, a game called No Second Chance, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, so, yes, um, so that was the Pendulands example. Um, Ed's already demoed this. You can draw things, they instantly become physics objects. Um, and he's also shown off the sliders. Um, and gone through the breakdown of them. Um, so there's all sorts of things you can tweak about these games. Um, so it's a very complicated uh, user interface. You need to know what you're doing. Um, I don't think Ed demoed this, but if you tap on these, a uh, text box comes up and tells you what they're there for. Um, and that gives you some information. Um, right now, you'd have to know a little bit about game design. You'd have to know what words like spawning mean. You'd have to possibly understand a bit of physics. Um, so it's not perfect. And um, the experiments I'm going to describe now have helped us to build a, a better uh, user interface um, as per Ed's future work section. And um, I'll demo that at the end to show off um, where we are with that right now. Um, so we had three people in the lab, me as one of the designers, I should put one of the designers of Gamaka there. Uh, I'm not giving you <laughs> nearly enough credit. Um, and uh, so that was me. I had four lots of 30 minute um, subsessions. I took breaks in the middle. Um, and I produced five sketches and five levels. Um, I tried for one game, and I ended up with a completely different game. I tried for, well, I'll, I'll go through that in a second. Um, and we also had Rob Saunders, who had recently joined the group. He'd had some practice with using the app, but certainly wasn't um, an advanced user. Um, and he had a two-hour session. He produced a game called Primordial Scoop, which is very artistic. Uh, it's a beautiful game, actually. Um, and then Mark uh, joined the group um, and had, had 20 minutes, I think, of experience, according to the way we wrote in the paper. Um, no experience whatsoever, really. And in one hour, produced an atmospheric kind of steady hand game, um, starting with Flappy Birds and ending with something a little bit different, but not too much. Um, so my timeline was as follows. There's the 120 minutes. Um, I was playing around. Um, I really I failed again. It's very difficult to produce a puzzle app because things are bouncing around. Um, I've, I've still not managed myself to produce a game which you would call a puzzle, but Mike has, and I'm going to demo that um, in, uh, at the end of the, the, the session. Um, and I was trying to produce a game like um, Flip Drop. I don't know whether any of you played that on the iOS. It was a top 10 for a while. A ball bounces in, in Flip Drop, Drop Flip, uh, it bounces in. You have to press things at the right time. Um, little platforms change, um, and the ball bounces out, and you have to get it to bounce into the cup. Um, and I was trying to go for something like that, um, but I failed to produce something, and I ended up with a game which was themed in a very macabre way, um, where you have to drop a bomb onto the head of a raven. Um, so, and this is all recorded in glorious Technicolor in a two-hour video, so if anyone wants to see that, it's a, it's a speak aloud psychological uh, methodology where I talk to myself while I'm designing these games. Um, and I'm particularly looking at the question of what emerges from this. Um, and there's, there's nice moments which I'll uh, talk about in a second. Um, so uh, yeah, there were emergent moments. And I settled on this game. Um, and uh, in the paper, I go through them uh, in fine detail. I've, I've highlighted a few here which are interesting. Um, so. Uh, the first one was I wanted to get the Bicho character um, to be in the right place, um, but the app only allowed me to put it on the edges, um, and then it was half off the edge. So that immediately stopped me from doing the game I wanted to make. Um, so I had to start thinking about a different game from the start. Um, the Bicho character, Bicho is like Spanish for a little animal, or cute um, stroke scary little animal. Um, and I was attempting to do something cute with these Bichos, and I ended up with a completely different game. Um, so I had to make it so that it starts half off the screen and then rises up. So it's a very slowly moving bird, and you have to get the bomb to hit it um, at the right time. Um, then I actually did something at meta level, um, and Mark did something similar, actually. I played back the first 30 minute video of me, and I kept hearing myself say the word bounce the whole time. Uh, and that reminded me of bouncing bomb, the, the wartime uh, effort to bomb dams. Um, and, um, that made me think of this as a, a bouncing bomb. Um, so I changed the Beto character to a kind of gothic raven character um, and make them explode rather than bounce. Um, and then I got myself this notion of, um, of killing ravens rather than trying to bounce things off a Beto to get into a, um, a bucket or into a target. So um, that was a, a nice meta-level emergence. Um, 
then I realized that um, I had to have, uh, so going back to this one here, um, I was attempting, as you can see, to get it to bounce through and hit the raven, so the ball comes down here, you have to quite carefully bounce it through. Um, I realized that actually you can just, um, you, there was a way of cheating that, um, so that you could do it too easily. So I switched to this, um, and I realized I had to have a line coming up across there. Otherwise, you can just get the ball to, to drop on the head, so you had to have the line to stop it. Um, and so that was a physical condition which emerged that I had to cater for. Um, and then if you look at this, um, this is the nicest moment for me. Um, I realized that this looks like a scythe, like, um, like death in Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Um, so that was it. I was set then on a macabre theme. Um, and that theme obviously plays out for the rest, albeit not so obviously. We then have um, a cross. These are rosary beads, you know, a priest has when you're dying. Um, actually, that, yeah, these are rosary beads as well. And these are coffins with um, crosses on. Um, is that, oh, no, no, here is a coffin of itself. A gravestone, sorry. The background is, actually, the background gave me the idea for rosary beads, and therefore this is now rosary beads. Uh, so this is actually a gravestone, and the, the ball goes in, you have to carefully, it's, it's got, um, it's affected by noise, so it moves around, and you have to kind of carefully cajole it into landing on the raven at the right time. This thing here is the, is the raven in a whole eight pixels. Um, and the final one was um, you have to carefully control the ball, and they get a little bit more difficult. Um, so that uh, essentially were some of the emergent moments, and they're all there in the paper. Um, and again, if you want the video, I can send you the video. Um, so that was the raven, sorry, the size thing. Um, and finally, this one was interesting as well because I realized that I'd inherited something from the base camp game, which I needed to turn off. Um, as I was turning it off, I looked at the possibilities for that parameter and realized that actually there was another um, possibility, which is to reverse things. Um, so tapping um, was killing things, which was making the game too easy. I needed to turn it off. Um, so tapping to reverse actually made to make, uh, was turned into the, the control level. Um, so uh, in this game, I think, um, it's too difficult. The ball comes in from here. You have to catch it. You have to rotate this around to catch it, um, to drop it on the head of the raven. It was a bit too difficult, and I couldn't be bothered to fix it particularly well. So I made it so that if the ball heads off, like this one is, you can tap it um, to reverse it. And, uh, and you save the game like that. I would have probably, if I was releasing this as, an, as a game, I would probably go back and make that a little bit more intuitive. Um, but that was a nice emergent moment from, um, uh, from seeing what the parameters can give. So um, please speak to uh, Mark and Rob Saunders, who's here in the Mew workshop at the moment, um, if you want more details or see the paper about their experience with it. To, um, to sum up, Rob's always been more interested in interactive experiences, art forms, rather than games with rules and, uh, and scoring mechanisms and win and fail. Um, so he was really trying to get um, an aquarium-like feel to his games. Um, and he achieved it uh, to a large extent, albeit through a tortuous two-hour session um, where he tried his damnedest to get rid of the controller so the, the user doesn't have much control at all. In the end, he narrowed it down to this controller. This is actually what you control in the game. And you really have no control over it except from being able to rotate it. So you really, it's like trying to grab a stick in water. You can't really grab it and hold it. You can just move it around a bit. And there's lots of wave functions in here, which is one of the parameters you can use. And essentially, you've got to try and catch all of the whites and blues um, in the time provided. So you do, you do eventually catch them all. It's actually one of the most, most uh, interesting games I've seen come out of the, um, of the app. Um, and it also highlighted an awful lot of issues with the GUI. Even for an intermediate um, user, um, he found it very, very difficult to achieve what he wanted to achieve. Um, but it is a, a, he did get there. He enjoyed the process, and it was an innovative game. Um, now, you can't, see, you can't see anything here. Um, barely see it on the screen. Um, so Mark came along and was interested in seeing whether he could get something uh, a la Flappy Bird. And we all want to do a Flappy Bird clone, don't we, at heart? Um, so this game should allow you to do something similar, um, although we didn't end up with that entirely. Um, so uh, essentially, um, you, well, you can't see it here, but there is a maze. It's a very dark game. Um, there's a maze. The ball comes in, and the, the light, the, the, the finger lights up where you are, and the, and the ball moves towards your finger. So you can only really see the maze in the locality of where your finger is, which makes it quite a tricky, scary game, really. Um, Mark, you had a productive use of the mutation functionality, which gave him a dim lighting aesthetic. 
Um, and there's a lovely moment at the end when uh, he wanted to post it as an animated GIF on uh, Twitter, um, and it gave him this posterized filter effect. I'm not sure why, actually. Um, and the posterized effect is something we're going to put into future versions of the software. So it didn't emerge from the software, but it emerged from a, a meta-level usage, um, and that's worth um, bearing in mind for the future, really. So again, there's more details in the paper. Um, there's probably 10 or 12 um, instances of emergence. With Mark and Rob, there was less emergence because they were more in the mode of, I want to achieve a certain thing, and I'll, I'm prepared to move away from it a little bit. With me, I was far more prepared to go with the flow um, and see what um, actually the software gave me rather than me giving the software. Um, so, this is where the hand-waving starts, uh, a computational reading of emergence. Um, so, we want to have an automated game designer, which produces entire games, um, which can take advantage of these emergent properties to make interesting casual games. Um, so, maybe you might give it a specification of a game in, in high level, and it goes off and gives you a wholly different game, which has emerged from it trying to make that game, and ultimately, uh, that game is, the, the emerged game is just as good as the one you were hoping for. Um, we found the computational reading extremely difficult, really. Um, lots of pulling of, you know, pulling of our hair, really, thinking what really all of these emergent things were quite diverse, um, very different from each other, and didn't really have computational equivalents. Um, so we, we, we wrote something up for the paper, um, but it's, it's not um, particularly sophisticated yet. We found we first need to describe what we need in an automated game designer as a, as a horribly crazy wish list of things we want, then to specify a setting um, in which uh, the software could make a game from start to finish, end to end, um, and then we characterize these emergent moments in a very rough computational way. We tried to think of AI equivalents, what software could do right now, what it could do in the future, um, but it wasn't always possible, so hence the, um, the hand-waving. So the wish list we came up with was uh, fairly obvious. We need an automated game player, something which can play this game. Um, a PCP module, which is a parameter change um, predictor. So essentially, we need to know in advance if the software makes a change in this parameter of the game, how will it alter the gameplay. Um, uh, we want a fun predictor, and I, I hear Mike turning in his grave when I say that. <laughs> I know, I know, um, predicting fun is extremely difficult. Um, but we could have some watered-down version of it to at least um, avoid miserable games. And in fact, Mike and Mark have been working on uh, ways of generating games for this No Second Chance, which aren't frustrating. So not quite fun, but not uh, you know, avoiding the really, really crappy ones. Um, and we, have, uh, we need a game analyzer which can produce statistics about the game um, from the genome level, from the uh, playtesting. Um, which has a machine vision module in there. Um, these are the kind of wish lists with the, 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 an analyzer informing the other modules, really. This is obviously theoretical. Um, we have bits of, of some of these, um, but there's nothing practical implemented um, except the automatic game player, but even that one is quite um, limited to just one or two games. So the design setting was as follows. There's a software chooses an existing game level from the base camp. No, 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 an existing game level in its mind, so like Flappy Bird. Um, or like Asteroids, something possibly from the Atari data set that um, Google have got, or actually no, it's separate to Google, that Google used. Um, so have in mind an existing game level which can be broken down into parts to be analyzed. Um, then choose a level from Gamica which approximates a level as much as possible. And then map the game elements as best as possible uh, and then tweak the game, hoping to try and produce a, a facsimile of this existing level. Very similar to what Mark did, really. Um, Rob didn't have that in mind. Rob had a, an aesthetic, a feeling in mind, um, whereas Mark really wanted to produce something along the lines of Flappy Bird. Um, and then at each of these stages, you take uh, uh, advantage of the emergent properties. So you're not just hoping to produce Flappy Birds and when you don't produce it, um, you, you just give up. You're going with the flow. You're saying, I can't, I can't do this, but this you know, gives me something interesting. And then with that uh, setting in mind uh, and the automated game design components I've already mentioned, we were able to characterize these emergent moments. Um, so we can use uh, the analyzer and the predictor to choose alternatives. So the, these are a breakdown of, of what happened with me, Mark, and Rob when we were designing turned into something computationally um, oriented. Um, so if you are trying to produce uh, a parameter, but the software just doesn't allow it, remember this is on-device game generation. It's not going to enable you to produce 
full-on first-person shooters. It's going to enable you to produce very simple casual games. So there's going to be all sorts of limitations. So you're going to run up against these limitations all the time. Um, and so then you, uh, you have to choose an alternative. The software uh, chooses an alternative. The fun predictor uh, predicts that this is an interesting outcome um, ad through playtesting, perhaps, or uh, in advance. Um, and we thought that that could possibly be managed by qualitative reasoning. We have tried to appeal to the literature there. Um, this is uh, Mark Kovacs has got some work in that area. Um, we, in a few of the occasions, um, we inherited game parameters from the base camp, like the tapping um, of deleting balls, which were annoying and had to get rid of. In other cases, we inherited things which were actually useful. Um, so that can often lead to interesting aspects. So don't delete all the bits you don't want. Um, keep them and see whether anything emerges from that from keeping them. Um, we also, some of the, if you read the paper, some of us, our designing obviously involved ourselves playtesting these games, and you try and game it. You try and game the game. You try and find ways of winning the game, not how the designer uh, thought of. Um, so you play it in unusual ways or experimental ways. So you can imagine getting the automated playtester to just play in weird ways. And if that turns out to be uh, fun, as predicted by the, the predictor, um, uh, then you can make that gameplay part of the objectives of the level. So um, playing around um, is an important part there. Um, you could use the, the, um, the analyzer to describe physical properties of the games in terms of what collides with what else, what gets exploded, where things end up. Uh, and then you could appeal to a knowledge base like um, a concept net, something like that. Um, and then change the game assets um, or the images appropriately. That's along the lines of changing the cute little Beecho character that I was originally working with to a raven, because you don't want to put the bomb on the head of a cute character. You want to put the bomb on the head of a raven, because it's more, far more scary and gothic. Um, so you could imagine um, realizing that things are exploding now, and it's not uh, quite appropriate to have a particular image um, or a sound, and so therefore change it. Um, Suggesting stronger levels um, if uh, they are more fun, so essentially just ramping up the difficulty. That was one of the uh, ways in which the designers uh, worked. Um, and again, on the opposite end, debug easy finishing strategies by getting the AP to try and play things in, in weird ways um, and uh, use the parameter prediction to suggest changes which will avoid them. Uh, the, finally, um, the machine vision module could, like I saw that size, I could certainly imagine machine vision um, uh, this kind of utopian uh, machine vision system that I'm imagining, uh, being able to spot things in games which weren't there by design and extracting them, changing the game narrative, changing some other aspects of the game. Um, and yeah, this was uh, something that I did uh, a little bit more than the others, which is just jump around the search space um, by mutating things and hoping for the best, really, and hoping that something will emerge serendipitously. So that's our computational reading based on those um, case studies. Um, this gives me a little bit of time, I hope, to demo um, the current version. Um, so we need to have the computational reading a far more precise, far more specific. Um, and we need to tie it in with all the work. But there is a background work section in the paper, of course. Um, but we need to see uh, how other people have uh, been approaching automated game design um, and bring that in. Um, we have automated playtesting, but it's not general enough. Um, and we have some game analysis code, um, which we've used in, in various papers, um, but we need more. And we've got nothing like a fun predictor or a predictor of how a, a change in our genome will affect the change in the game um, uh, when it's played. So there's a lot of work to do in this notion of emergence, but it's something we really want to study. Um, and we can now a little bit more easily because we don't have to worry about a game design taking months and weeks, uh, weeks and months being done by a team of 20 people and so on. Um, or even just an indie game developer working on his or her own um, over weeks. And we can now do it in minutes on our phone and analyze that and see more concretely how um, things emerge. So um, our first app on the App Store will be uh, a free offering. Um, we're using it to get um, the word of MetaMakers Institute out there, secure some uh, real estate on the App Store, and get over the technical hurdles of getting something out there, which are numerous. Um, it'll be called No Second Chance. Um, and what we've done there is we've, we've narrowed things down. Um, not quite as narrow as Let It Snow and the variance, because all we can do there is really draw a new uh, game controller or a new way of the balls bouncing around. Um, but um, we've narrowed it down to just games where you have to catch balls. Um, and within that space, it's still 
thousands, we hope, uh, of different game mechanics, and it's fairly easy to generate a new game. Uh, and then I can, so I'll give a demo of this now, and I can show you where we are in terms of the polish of the UI. Um, Ed's right, there isn't enough experience in the group, but we're getting there with the user interface. It's far more uh, intuitive now than it was previously. Um, and here we are, as you can, can see that. So, yeah, we have an icon. Second chance. Uh, and a splash screen designed by Rob. Um, so, no second chance stands for the competition we're running. We want to make a big splash with this. We want to shake things up a bit. We don't, we don't need to make the money quite yet. We can try and make the money by being quite different, change the world a little bit. Um, so, in no second chance, it will really be about a competition. Um, and we will give to the players 50 levels. It'll be a crowdsourcing exercise. We want to find the world's best meta game player. And by meta player, we mean um, someone who can pick up the, le the, the mechanic of a game fairly quickly, understand it, work out the ramifications, get their finger skillful enough to, to um, take advantage of that understanding, and finish the game level in five minutes. Um, and someone out there in the world will be best at that. Um, they'll go through these 50 levels, um, and uh, ultimately they're very similar, but um, each one requires different understanding. Um, and that person will be given some kind of prize. Um, I think Mike's idea was to en enshrine them in, an, in a bot which can play like them um, and live forever after they die, um, which won't happen straight away, I presume. Um, and uh, so just to show you the kind of levels, I, I wanted to show you this one, which I've extracted elsewhere. Um, this is a level that both Mark and Mike failed to complete in 10 minutes. Um, and to show you the kind of game. So you've got to catch these balls. Um, so I'm trying to catch the light blue ones. Uh, and they, I need to get five to win. Um, and remember, this took, these guys managed to fail it in 10 minutes. Uh, and I should be able to solve it in a few seconds. So there is a, I mean, I'm better at this than most people because um, I've designed these games and I've been playing them for a long time. Um, but, ah, bollocks. <laughs> is that on, on video? Uh, yeah, because it's not as easy as that. Yeah. <laughs> I should be able to get one more, shouldn't I? Here we go. Ah, crap. OK, so I was hoping to make it look really easy. When I played it the other day <laughs> in front of Mark, I managed it in 10 seconds. So um, I've got off to a bad start, haven't I? Um, so I won't, I won't bore you more with that. Um, <laughs> it is easier than you might think. Um, and you know there are, there are plenty of other levels. Um, so there's, each of these 50 um, levels have got something different about them. Um, so can I show you another one? Um, I, some are, so this level, you've got to try and get the blues inside and keep them there. Um, so, th so you've got to work out what the, um, what the game mechanic is. So the oranges are the bad guys. They can't get inside, but the blues can get inside, and you can keep them there. Um, so once you work that out, it's just a matter of trying to do it efficiently. Um, so each level will come with a health warning on three uh, axes. Um, there will be skill, there will be um, patience, and there will be ingenuity. In the ingenuity, you'll have to work out what the hell is going on, and that will be really quite tricky. With the skill, you'll know what's going on, but your finger won't be quite good enough. Um, and in the patience one, you just have to wait for that killer moment and be ready for it. Um, and games with all three of those maxed out will be particularly difficult. But we're going to design it so that there are people out there who can, who can win in, um, do them all in five goes, in five minutes, I should say. And so once the um, player has got through this, um, that will be it. They will never play these games ever again. In fact, once they've been past level one, they will never, ever see level one ever again, um, which goes against casual game design. We're not going to pander to player uh, the usual casual game um, uh, notions of carefully guiding your player through the... Um, through the, uh, the level, introducing things extremely slowly, saying well done, telling them how to do it. Um, no, we're going to drop people in there. There will be a bit of a, a learning period, but people will get dropped in there, and if they don't solve it in five minutes, that's it. They will never play it again. For those people who get to the end of the 50 levels, and it should take between two and three hours, um, then um, they will get the bonus of having the design screen. So this is back now to Gamica Technologies. So by making, you're only allowed to, to, to get games where you have to land five balls on a target, 
Um, that's massively narrowed down the possibilities for this game um, and made it amenable to a more uh, intuitive interface. Which, this is our first um, shot at it, actually our second shot at it. I, I, I kept that dial interface against the wishes of everybody in the team for far too long uh, and eventually had to you know, suck it up and get rid of it. Um, and now we've got this more intuitive um, menuing system. The, um, these are properties of the balls. These are where the balls spawn. These are how they move. These are how pairs collide. And then you've got extras for the look and the audio. Um, I can't turn the sound on, I think. OK. Um, so we've got a great soundtrack, actually. I can't. Can I put it on this? No. Um, so, uh, so if I want to change the, uh, the, if I start with this base one, I can change the, the color of the balls, for example. Um, so we've got all these colors. Note the, uh, note the scrolling, Ed. I'm very proud of that. Uh, uh, so if you want to make them green, it instantly, and you can play it in the middle here um, while you're designing. Um, if you want to change how quickly they stick, right now the greens stick in one second. If I want them to stick, take a lot longer, which will make the game far too difficult, I now have to hover the yellow over the, the target over them for much longer and they won't stick and they're off. Um, so that's probably a bad idea. Um, whether they score or not, what happens when you tap them? Right now when you tap the greens, nothing happens. But you could, for example, choose to destroy them. So now when I play this game, um, I can destroy them. You can't see it, but I am tapping them. Um, and the, you've got this history down the bottom here um, so that you don't forget where you've been. Um, you can change uh, all the things you might want to change, um, like how, what happens when two of different types collide. Right now, both get destroyed, but it may well be that they stick. This will change the game quite a bit, I think, because um, it will make, make it difficult for the greens to get in now. Um, so you can see I've got all sorts of control from the design side. Um, let's go back up. Um, and yeah, there's all sorts of things whether the balls are attracted to, uh, actually, that's the wrong one, where they're going. Um, there are, balls are heading towards the opposite side right now. They could be heading towards the center. This will change the game look. So you'll see everything heading towards the center now, yeah. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, what, one way of doing it will be um, the old way of designing, really, which is having an idea in mind. Can I get flappy birds out of this? Um, can I get asteroids? Um, another way will just be to press this question mark button up here um, and let it generate one for you. Right now it generates it in a very naive way, but Mark and Mike have worked on a way of um, filtering the games uh, between a lower bound and an upper bound of uh, annoyingness, I think, is, is where we're putting it. Certain games are annoying um, and you just don't want to play them, you'll delete them straight away. But right now all it does is take um, 10 of the 50 competition levels, so these levels here, um, and cross over aspects of them in blocks. Um, so at chromosome level, really, rather than genome level. Um, back to the designer. And you can just press go and hope for the best. Well, I can see it on my screen, but you can't see the target there. Let me just change the target. Um, actually, I'm going to put it into a palette um, because this gives me everything in one go. Can you see that? Yeah, that's better. Um, so I've no idea what this game is. I absolutely have no idea whether it's playable. Um, whether it's going to be enjoyable or whether it's just dull. This one looks quite tedious. Um, and this, is like, this will likely be ruled out by your code because it's actually impossible, unless tapping them does something. So I could save this um, by, and this is, this is a repeat of something which has previously happened. I can definitely save this by essentially saying um, what happens when I tap these things uh, by going there, tap will reverse. So now it makes it a game where you've got to uh, try and keep them on a the target and reverse them up by tapping them and then keep them going. Um, one of the levels was produced exactly like this, in fact. Um, oh, they stick together, which is something different, which, ooh, okay. Well, so there we go. There is an emergent moment. Um, I've not seen that before. I've not tried tapping a cluster. Uh, and I, I actually have no idea what happens when you clap, tap a cluster. Let me restart. Um, so that's the kind of thing which happens. I was hoping it would. Um, and this isn't, uh, this isn't a put-up. Um, when they hit you... Sorry? Okay. So things emerge, um, and you can save them um, and pass them on and share them with your friends. And uh, interestingly, you can record the screen now and share things um, accordingly. And you get great games like um, this one, 
by Mike. Uh, this one's called Lifeguard. This is the only puzzle game I've seen out there. Nothing moves, which is uh, completely different. Um, so you've got, to, you've got to think about how you're going to get those five on the target because colliding will, will kill them. So you have, to carefully uh, 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 you have to carefully work out where you're going to go. Ah, crap. Um, so this makes it a far more interesting game than most I've seen. Uh, and it's, it really is finally a puzzle, so I probably can't get the rest now. The one at the bottom is going to kill me. Um, and you have to wait around, um, and so Lifeguard is the first puzzle game. So I'll leave it at that, um, but please, uh, any feedback you've got uh, on where we go with this app will be very much appreciated. Cheers.